a new straw hat, Robin being Luffy's older sister and the biggest explosion we have seen in the history of One Piece. And no, I'm not talking about Atlas here, although she was without any doubt the MVP of Eckhart Island being the one who finally sacrifices herself for the sake of the straw hats. You see, with chapter 1120, the One Piece manga has set up some truly insane things as Luffy and the crew are now finally sailing away from Egghead and towards their next destination. And honestly, there's just so much to discuss here, I don't even know what to start with. I mean, there's Lilith, Professor D. Clover, or the Iron Giant. I mean, all three are equally massive things, so let's just work through these in order, I guess. Meaning that I guess we can start by saying, welcome to the crew, Lilith slash Vegapunk, question mark? Okay, here's where we're at with this plot point. At this point in the story, after Atlas's very brave and honestly quite moving sacrifice, I did tear up a lot reading it, Vegapunk and all of his satellites are now dead, with two very notable exceptions. York, who betrayed all the other Vegapunks to the world government, will most likely leave the island alive and well with the Gorosei and then probably join them up in Marijua to either, I guess, install the Mother Flame there or, in case it gets destroyed here, create a new one from scratch. And then, on the other hand, we have Lilith, who is now knocked out on board of the Thousand Sunny. Why knocked out? Well, because Atlas, out of nowhere, gave us some of that sweet chin music and punched her fellow Vegapunk number two into a coma. However, after a short moment of collective shock between Straw Hats and the audience, us, it did turn out that she just took a page out of Garp's playbook and it was all a fist of love after all. Because you see, with Nasjiro, who, by the way, let's be real here for a second, out of all the Gorosei has earned by far the most respect from me during this whole arc with his crazy powers and appearance. With him about to destroy the Sunny, Atlas knew that Lilith would probably not stay behind and try to fight as well. And so in a real act of love, Atlas made sure that she would stay safe and escape together with the Straw Hats. That, but I also strongly suspect also to make sure that at least one good Vegapunk would survive the Egghead Island island incident as well, and thus be able to help save the world. Now, on top of that, we also see Atlas either removing something from Lilith's head or switching something off, which immediately makes York and her probably as well lose contact with her. So what probably happened here was that York uncoupled Lilith from the shared Vegapunk consciousness and probably even from the punk records itself, which will not only hide the fact that she has escaped from the Gorosei, but as we will also see in a little bit, makes it a lot more reasonable for Lilith Lilith to become a straw hat. Meaning that Lilith will from now on officially be traveling with Luffy and the crew. But is Lilith actually gonna join the crew as a straw hat here or is this gonna be more of a law slash VB situation with her tagging along for an arc or two before she then is being dropped off somewhere else and kind of ends up doing her own thing? Well, I think the best thing to do here is just look at the pros and cons here. And the first pro, I'm just gonna say it, I just want Lilith to join the crew. I mean, yeah, that's not very objective, but hear me out here. We haven't had a single new crew member since the time skip, with the sole exception of Jinbei, who has kind of already been part of the story for a long, long time before that. We didn't get Yamato, which honestly still really hurts my feelings thinking about it, and we are also in dire need of balancing out the sausage festival that has become the Straw Hat crew. Now, to be fair, you could also say, well, what about Bonnie? And that is totally an option I also still see as very realistic right now as well. I mean, she's there together with Lilith. But Lilith also has a quite unique personality that I think would fit in quite nicely with the crew. One, she's pretty tough and rough, but in a very different way than, say, Nami. She's also insanely capable as a fighter, but not in a way that would threaten the already existing power dynamic of the crew. On top of that, despite being edgy, she is fundamentally a really good person and easily quirky enough to have a great screen presence and also chemistry with the rest of the crew. Plus, basically, her entire family, or I guess parts of herself, have now been murdered here after a massive betrayal, giving her, I think, more than enough reason.
reasons to join Luffy and fight the world government and also save the world from flooding. Something that the OG Vegapunk really wanted to do anyway. So I think we can actually tick off a surprising amount of classic needed to be a straw hat checkboxes with a tragic backstory, a dream and a reason to follow Luffy. Now on the con side of things here, even though physically Lilith might not be total overkill joining the crew, Knowledge-wise, having her on board could end up being a real problem story-wise. For one, with a Vegapunk on board, would someone like Frankie just not become somewhat obsolete? Or would they just start working together on stuff? And similarly, Vegapunk knows a lot, and I mean a lot, about the Void Century and all the research done on Ohara. So would that make Robin's role somewhat obsolete as well? But you see, actually, it's right here, I think, where Atlas comes into play once again because if Lilith has now truly been decoupled from the punk records and all the other Vegapunks, it might just be the case that like 90% of the knowledge that Vegapunk actually had will now not be accessible to her anymore since all the Vegapunks all uploaded and accessed their shared knowledge to that central database. And that in turn could mean that Lilith is still a very smart and capable scientist, but without all of the insane collective knowledge and memories of all the combined Vegapunks, essentially making her now her own unique person for maybe the first time in her life. And honestly, thinking about that, I mean, with all the machine versus human symbolism that we had going on in Egghead, you know, with Kuma and Kizaru, Cog in the Machine, all these things, Lilith, an artificial being that's part of a sort of hive mind, becoming now her own real human by joining Luffy, would in a strange way feel very fitting to this arc, if you agree with me here. Now, with all of that being said, as always, I think we all gotta be really careful to get our hopes up here, since Oda has burned us more times than I can count with hopes for a new straw hat, but suffice to say, I would be more than excited myself to welcome Lilith to the crew from here on out. Which now already brings me to maybe the biggest reveal of this chapter somehow, the fact that Professor Clover's full name is actually Cleve D. Clover, which First of all, epic name bro, props to that, but second is of course an absolute massive reveal that, as we will see, might have massive implications for Robin as well. Also, I just gotta say, of course the guy who found out most about the Void Century and worked his entire life against the Celestial Dragons and the government was AD. Now, what does Cleave here even mean? Because the spelling is definitely giving me headaches, I mean, the Japanese original reads actually Kurao, which when you Google it actually seems to be the Japanese reading of the Irish word cleave, which apparently is how you pronounce whatever this is, but I'm not exactly confident that I nailed it here either, if you get me. Now, Cleave Solas is a magical light sword from Irish mythology, of course Irish, I mean Professor Clover has the entire Ireland theme going on there, which according to my good old friend from my high school years, Wikipedia, seems to appear commonly as a quest object of a hero seeking the one story. I'm like quoting directly from Wikipedia here, which my teacher told me to never do, but I did it anyways. And while I honestly was somewhat skeptical at first if this was actually the inspiration that Oda drew from, once I read that sentence from the article, it was kind of like jackpot, because let's be real, what better way to describe Clover here than as a man who dedicated his life to seeking the one story, the lost story of the world, the for forbidden history. Also, the Sword of Light does seem interestingly relevant when we talk about the D-Clan. I mean, the Void Sentry and the literal Sun God and Joy Boy are there, but that's something I'm gonna say for another really big D-Clan theory I'm cooking together right now as well, where like this clever reveal is gonna play a really big role. So instead, I wanna take this in a slightly different direction, because the first thing I thought when I read Clover's real name was that Robin might then also be a D clan member, Nico D. Robin. Now, of course, just like you, I then immediately also thought to myself, oh, Clover isn't really actually related to Robin, so that makes no sense. Except it actually does make sense. And it might prove actually that Robin could be the daughter of either Goldie Roger or 
of Monkey D. Dragon, making her Luffy's older sister either directly or indirectly through Ace. Yes, we're gonna go absolutely crazy in this chapter review as well. And the very first thing pointing into that direction of that possibility, even if simple, is that Robin was born and raised on Ohara, you know, the island with the oldest known thing in the One Piece history as the Tree of Knowledge growing on the island is over 5,000 years old, which makes it 4,000 years older than even the Void Century. And since Clever seems to be a native from Ohara, speculating that more families than just a single one on this ancient island could have been part of the D-Clan is pretty reasonable, I think, meaning that the Nico family could very well be a D-Clan member as well. And actually looking at this a bit closer, the name Nico in itself might be the next clue right here. After all, Nico comes from the ancient Greek word Nike. I actually had to take ancient Greek for like three years in high school, uh, don't ask why. And Nike means victory, that's why the brand Nike is called that as well, with names like Nico or Nicholas usually being translated as victory of the people, which again, could this be any more fitting to Robin, who is the thorn in the eye of the world government that tyrannizes the people of the world? I don't think so, but also that ancient Greek name seems to be a very similar style of naming to Clover's ancient Irish name or even the ancient Egyptian name Nefatari. So again, just based on its meaning and history alone, I think that the Nico family would make a fantastic part of the D-Clan looking at the two known members, Robin and her mother, Albia. But how in the world does this connect to Roger or even Dragon? Well, turns out that Robin's mother, Albia, is the key to this mystery as well. Let's actually take a quick look at the One Piece timeline, shall we? Because I think that's always fun to do. Now, in the current storyline, leaving Eckhead Island, Robin right now is 30 years old. That means that when we first meet her on Alabasta, she was 28 years old before the time skip. We do know that the O'Hara incident took place 22 two years prior to that, meaning that Robin was eight years old when the Buster Call happened and Clover and Albia were killed by the Gorosei. I mean, not literally by the Gorosei, but technically they were the ones who were responsible here. And of course, it was the same year when Albia first returned from her six-year expedition trying to find and study the Poneglyphs. Two years before the O'Hara incident, Roger was executed in Loketown, where Robin was still six years old. And a year before that, Robin being five year, Odin returns to Wano after having reached Laugh Tale with Roger. And the year before that, Roger first meets Odin and recruits him during his duel with Whitebeard where he holds up a baby Hiori and says that it's been quite a while since he last held a baby, at which point Robin is now four years old. Now, to be completely fair here, he could be talking about Shanks or even Buggy here, who is a teenager at this point. But since Hiyori is a baby girl, four years since holding a baby Robin would very much fit nicely into the timeline here, I think. But let's keep moving here, because going back yet another two years and a two-year-old Robin, this is the very year that Albia first leaves Ohara to go on her mission. Coincidentally, it's also the very same year that Roger finds out about his terminal illness and decides to enter the Grand Line one last time in order to fulfill his dream of finding the final island of the Grand Line and going around the world. I'm just gonna say very interesting timing on that. Now everything so far lines up pretty nicely I'd say, but we still need to do a lot more work here. Now our next piece of evidence comes comes from the fact that we do know for a fact that Albia set out on her mission to study the Poneglyphs in order to honor the wishes of her husband slash Robin's father. We don't actually know if she was ever married. Again, with Roger setting out to find Love Tail that very same year, Albia setting out to find and study the stones for him would make a lot of sense, I think. And then when she returns six years later after getting captured and the other archaeologists with her being killed, Professor Clover is actually the one who apologizes to her for sending her on such a dangerous mission. Meaning that Clover and Robin's father were the actual main two drivers behind that expedition in the first place. On top of that, Robin has pitch black hair despite her mother quite literally having the exactly opposite hair color, Snow White. Now to me that basically guarantees that Robin's father must have had black hair and some pretty strong genes as well to just completely cancel 
cancel out Olbia completely. And I think that the notoriously strong genes of a D clan member would explain that feature pretty nicely. Now, the next question here, of course, is is it possible that Clubber knew Roger? I mean, given all that we know about both of them, I think no one would be surprised if they at some point worked together for some time, learning about the past and maybe even inspiring Roger to look for Love Tail in the first place. And on top of that, we also kind of know that Roger was a man very notorious and eager to spread his own genes, later on also fathering Ace. So Robin being Roger's secret daughter seems to be a much more legitimate looking theory with this newest revelation about Clover being a D member. However, the other black hair D clan member who we know for a fact was friends with Vegapunk and Clover is of course none other than Luffy's father, Monkey D. Dragon. Now, Olbia dating the former Marine who had just founded the Freedom Fighters that would later then turn into the Revolutionary Army would again also make quite a lot of sense, I think. And in fact, do you remember that Dragon actually came with flowers to Ohara after the Buster Call and we really have no idea who exactly they were for? The entire island? Clover? I mean, it's possible. His wife and daughter? I think a lot more possible. And I'm gonna be a little bit sexist right here but a hard-boiled macho type guy like Dragon bringing flowers somehow seems more likely that that would be something that he'd do for his own family rather than just for a friend of his. After all, he must have lost a ton of friends and comrades at this point in time and he just doesn't seem like the type to bring flowers for each and every one of them, but I might be wrong about that. But what maybe sells this idea even more so is that Kuma, Dragon's right-hand man who knew Vegapunk, made sure to send Robin to none other other than Dragon and the Revolutionary Army during the time skip. Which, again, would just be such a fantastic move by Oda because if this was actually a father-daughter reunion and not just the Revolutionary Army taking an interest in Robin's skills and knowledge, I would absolutely love that. Now, of course, that would in turn also mean that Robin would be Luffy's older sister. Well, half-sister, I guess, since Nico Albia, as far as we know, did actually die during the Ohara incident. Now, I do know that some people will really, really dislike this idea but I gotta say, me personally, if we actually found out that Robin was a D member and got saved by her younger brother, I think that would be some of the most heartwarming and well-crafted writing in the entire story, and you know that would say something. But that might just be me. Let me know what you think about that idea in the comments. Maybe I overlooked something. Maybe there's evidence that points against that possibility. In the meantime, let's go from the biggest explosion in One Piece so far, Ohara, to what is most likely going to be the new biggest explosion in the story, SMF, the ancient iron giant, now seems to be preparing some sort of last resort, self-destruction, ultimate attack type of thing in an attempt to take out the Gorosei with him and so protect protect the new Joy Boy. Also, let me just say, maybe Luffy now finally understands that he is actually Joy Boy, but then again, it's Luffy, so maybe not. Now, the reason I say this is that so far, none of Vegapunk's laboratories have survived without some massive sort of destruction so far. Whether it's his own built-in self-destruct button or two admirals just going absolutely hammock on the entire island, Vegapunk labs have a tendency to blow up. So why in the world would Egghead be any different and break this tradition. Well, clearly, Emeth is on his very last legs here and has been saving some sort of ace up his sleeves, or metal arms, I guess, for a moment just like this. So my personal prediction would be, as it has been all along, that Egghead Island will be just completely blown up, raised to the ground with all the Gorosei still right there on the islands. The big question here, of course, being, would that actually do anything? After all, Atlas literally did a mini version of exactly this early in the chapter and Nasjudo just regenerated his face instantly and by the way also his brain which I honestly it's just next level scary and unkillable you can't kill the Gorosei even when destroying their head it seems which how do you kill them honestly but then again does the iron giant actually have some sort of different hidden power that can actually hurt the gorosei i mean him cutting off one of their tusks does seem to somewhat suggest exactly that so the gorosei may actually be in for a real surprise right here but then again it would be very surprising and honestly 
a little bit disappointing if the Gorosei were to just straight up die right here after all the crazy hype stuff that they have shown us so far. So I would guess that even if Emeth does manage to decimate the entire island, I think the Gorosei will make it out of this alive, either by teleporting or by just being too indestructible. And it looks like after that, we will finally be heading to the next island, or maybe, hear me out, even islands, as the Straw Hats might very well be splitting up into different factions here, up to three. And if you want to know where I think what group of Straw Hats will go to next, you can watch that prediction video right here. As always, Shanks, so much for watching, and I will hopefully see you in this next one.